All right. Well, thank you all once again for joining us here at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, and specifically here at the Competitive Advantage Talks, sponsored by Kager, or Craft Analytics Group. My name is Leo Fondrist. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce the future of soccer data in North America, presented by Chris Schlosser, the senior VP of Emerging Ventures at Major League Soccer. Thank you. Good morning. Hope everyone's having a good uh, start to their day. It's fantastic to be here in Boston. Uh, weather held out, which is, which is awesome for us. We have amazing things happening at MLS, and it's fun to finally be able to talk a little bit about what we're up to. If you think about the sport of soccer here in North America, it's been the sport that's always growing. It's always going to be the next most popular thing. But I'm here to tell you that day is now. You can see the growth rates. You can see what's happening in and around the league. And so we think that this is just a tremendously interesting time to be really diving in and focusing on the sport here in North America. Of course, we have a little event coming in a couple of years that will be transformational. If you think about business generally, it's so rare that you have the ability to put a stake in, in the ground and say, we know that something is going to completely accelerate our business in four years' time. So the question for us and for much of the world right now is what do you do over these next four years to make sure that you're in a great position when the world's eyes are on North America in 2026? Everybody's coming. All the major leagues are in the sports world or soccer world are talking about this. So how do we make sure we're prepared and how do we take full advantage of this uh, when it does, does come? What is MLS though? This answer has changed dramatically since the pandemic. When we, when we went into the pandemic, we were a scrappy first division league here in North America. Growing quickly, 25 years old, doing all the great things with a great set of investors. Whole confluence of, of events came together and we emerged out of the pandemic in a dramatically different position. Sure, we still have the first, first division MLS, 29 teams, continues to grow like a weed. We also launched last year something we called MLS Next Pro. It's our second division, 28 teams right now, this thing is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. You could see having 50 or so teams in a couple of years. And then in the middle of the pandemic, US soccer shut down the largest youth program here in the United States. It's called the US Soccer Development Academy. We had an emergency meeting of our board. And two days later, we launched MLS Next. It's a massive program, 12,000 kids. 10,000 matches a year, 350 on every single weekend. That's an entire Premier League season, every single weekend, all, basically all year long. And so as, as we emerge from the pandemic, we now have a fully integrated system from the time you're 13 to the time you're, you're playing for the first team, all under MLS auspices. We have a committed board and ownership group that are investing like crazy, not just in the top line brands and marketing, but in the underlying facilities. Here in Boston, they built a beautiful training center out right near Gillette Stadium. That's happening all across our league, investments in all of these different underlying pieces that we need to, to grow this, this world. So what does that mean for, for data? And why is data interesting to us? We believe that over a period of time, we'll be, late, we'll be able to create one of the most comprehensive databases of soccer players anywhere in the world. Just think about some of those numbers I rattled off before in terms of number of players, et cetera. There's unbelievable opportunity for us here. And that's just in North America. To say nothing of the opportunities beyond our borders, to think about you know, all of the Americas and all of the players that are uh, participating in this great sport around the world. This, by the way, is the Revs uh, training facility that they opened uh, last year or the year before. 
So how do we start this? Step one, and this is a little bit of breaking news, we announced this yesterday, you may have seen, but we're completely reworking the data ecosystem for the top league MLS. Surveyed the globe over the last 18 months to find the most innovative, most progressive partners that, that we could find with the highest quality data. And you see the, the partners we're, we're working with there, there on the screen. So what is that, how does that actually come to life? It's a little bit of an eye chart, but in Sportech, we have a, a team that is creating all of the data and creating a whole set of new services for us. Very, very high quality event data collection, same that's used at the World Cup. Integrating into that high quality tracking data, so you're taking the eventing data and the tracking data and putting it together so that you can create all sorts of interesting outputs. Next gen stats, insights for coaches, real time, very low latent data for broadcast. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then a whole host of software and tools that, that go around with it. But the most important thing on this slide isn't the fancy cameras or the data or anything that, like that. It's something pretty simple. It's that data hub. Because in the world that we live in, it's almost impossible to aggregate players and all this information because you end up with different suppliers. You, you, you're going to have to have different suppliers given the variety of different training environments, fields, et cetera. So by creating a data, data hub for the league, we've never had this before, common player IDs from the time you're 13 to the time you're on the first division program allows us to create a longitudinal data set at mass scale to do player scouting, player analysis, performance analytics. We've never had this before, and there's very few places on Earth that you have this volume of matches that you can go and, and create something like this. Sometimes it's the unsexy things that actually unlock the most value. So, key deliverables. That core data system that I talked about. Very low latent live tracking data for our clubs. Low latency video, thanks to our great new partners at Apple. All of our coaches have the latest and greatest iPads on the field of play. Um, our refs are wearing Apple watches. There, there will be more and more of that technology integration, but you need the pipes to, in order to power it. And then broadcast data and graphics. So one of the other building blocks was installing camera systems into our venues. We installed 12 4K cameras into every single one of our, our venues over the last four weeks. It's complicated, but one of the interesting insights is more and more in the soccer world is gonna be generated off these cameras. It's tracking data today, skeletal data. It's the baseline for the semi-automated offside system that, that was run at the World Cup, but that's just the start. And the demand for more and more and more cameras, especially at the top level, is only increasing. And so we anticipate a world where you don't have 12 cameras, you may have many, many more than that. And that requires significant upgrades into our back end in terms of fiber and connectivity, bandwidth, so that we can move all of these, these things around. Because all this has to happen very, very quickly in order to power any of the, the downstream impacts that, that you want to have. Every one of our clubs was given this year, uh, starting last weekend, high quality live video. There's a three or four second latency. We can decrease that if we wanted to, but that, that allows us to run it into the cloud and, and provide wider uh, availability for that video. Uh, so every club is getting two behind the goals, a pano and an auto cam that, that keeps basically the 20 field players um, in, in view at all times. They're also getting access to a live program feed uh, or broadcast feed so they have the commentary. It's all plugged into that iPad on the, on the bench, um, allowing them to really dive in um, and create real-time insights for, for the head coaches. We also at the league are sucking it into a league system. Not surprisingly, we use it for discipline, we use it for referee review, making sure that you know, downstream there's all sorts of interesting use cases for us. On the data side, 
I won't go into too much detail here, but one of the things that Sportech has given us is full control of our data. It's the first time we've ever had that. We always reply, relied in the past on other third party suppliers. And so if you wanted a data feed, you had to go argue with them over their structures, what they're doing for other leagues, did it make sense? And that just doesn't work for a league like MLS. Especially doesn't work as we think about things like Next Pro. Next Pro, for example, and I'll talk about it in a, in a minute in a little bit more depth, this year instituted a brand new rule. It's time wasting in soccer, the guy rolling around on the ground, it's been something that people have tried to eliminate for years without much success. So the team at Next Pro came up with an interesting idea. If the trainer comes out on the field, the player has to go off for three minutes. It was interesting, they, they applied this rule halfway through the, the season. On average, in an in a MLS game, the trainer comes out about six times a game, five or six times a game. They instituted the rule, that dropped overnight to one and a half times. Suddenly, it turned out the guy rolling around on the ground didn't really need that medical treatment. And so that was able to increase the effective time of the matches and decrease the amount of time wasting. We're gonna test it again this season, and the goal is to be able to roll out in, in the first team at some point. Now, why is that interesting in, in this use case? Obviously, it's a very cool rule. In our past, because we relied on all these third-party data suppliers, you could never get them to in, integrate the key data points that you need to do the analysis of whether that rule change had any impact on the effective time for the match. Now, Sportech, when we control all of the data, we control all of our feeds, we can create a custom element so that every time the trainer comes out, that's getting scored. We can then put that into our data sets or run all sorts of interesting analysis on is that actually impacting the game in the way we think it is. MLS season pass. I'm con contractually required to mention this in every presentation that I give. Uh, this is our new partnership with Apple, started last, last week. Um, this is transformational. Every single match available all over the globe for one price. No blackouts, 1080p, super high quality pictures, available on basically every digital device. Because it's either available via the Apple TV app or it's available via web browser. On the broadcast side, this is really important because it also gives us full control over the experience. In the past, you would have to go to a regional sports network or a national network if you wanted to get any data into a broadcast. Now, working with our partners at Delta Tray, we're able to insert directly live data into every single one of these matches. So I heard the, the previous conversation about just how challenging it is to connect all those dots. And it really is a challenge. You have to educate people that don't may, perhaps know the sport of soccer. So it'll be an evolving process, but it gives us really cool examples to change the way soccer is viewed and differentiate from anything else in, in the world today. And here's just an example of something that um, we rolled out last weekend, attacking zones, where on the field is a particular player or a team attacking. This is just scratching the surface, um, but there'll be a lot more like this coming uh, in the future. Six matches this weekend are free, so you can go check it out uh, and uh, see for yourself what, what these matches look like on any of your digital devices. MLS Next Pro. So a, a minor league in the United States has never had advanced tracking data until this season for MLS Next Pro. When we're rolling out with Signality and our, and our partners at IMG Arena, full tracking data for every one of those matches. How do they do it? They use a, a two camera system using computer vision, highly automated because for MLS Next Pro, we have to be economically efficient. We can't throw tons and tons of people at this. And so we're testing using fully automated systems. We'll look at do we add more cameras to this in the future. But March 25th, when that season launches, they will have tracking data for the first time. Sportech will integrate this into the very high quality eventing data, again, creating a, a differentiated experience for our, for our analyst community. Utilizes the same core ID system that I talked about, that hidden piece that, that's so important, and allows us to, to 
test the creation of all sorts of new data points to see if they're ready for deployment in, in our first team. But we're just getting started. This thing is a beast. Think about what I said earlier, 10,000 matches a year. Think about how you possibly create data for 10,000 matches. You can't throw people at it. It's just not economically possible. We've looked at it. We do 3,000 matches today, and that's, we basically spend more money to create data from MLS Next than we do for MLS um, proper because of the, the cost of all, that, all those humans to score these games. So we're going to be launching an RFP process here uh, next week or the week after to try to find new solutions for, for soccer data. We need high quality data that our coaches can use. In MLS Next, it doesn't have to be live, right? It can be delivered the next day or during the week. That's okay given it, it, it's youth competitions. 10,000 matches though, we're not sure that there's anybody out there that, that can actually achieve that scale. And so we may break it up and give you know, three companies, whatever, 3,000 matches as a way to test and run a little bit of a bake off. Um, but we're looking to have this be the base to use our core data system so that we can create that longitudinal tracking and build over time AI-based scouting systems to help identify who's that 13-year-old left back who we think has what it takes to make it to the first team. And last but not least, we'll be announcing later, uh, this is a little bit of a sneak preview, later this summer, something we call MLS Labs. It'll be an annual program that allows startups to utilize the, the scale and the testing that, that we have. Um, so you'll basically, you'll be given a chance to test at the MLS Fest, which is a massive youth competition in December at Coachella. Thousands and thousands of kids, hundreds of fields. It gives us a great uh, way to test things out. The best of that will progress to our Generation Adidas Cup, which is a super high level youth tournament held at the IMG Academy uh, in April with the best MLS youth teams versus the best uh, global youth teams. It's one of the premier youth competitions anywhere in the world. The best three companies that make it through those two steps will be given a chance to come to our all-star game, present to the MLS board, 30 billionaires, that's a, that's a pretty good room to, to present to, and do a live demo at either the, the MLS All-Star Game or our uh, Youth All-Star Game that, that happens during, during All-Star Week. So, tremendous program. We'll be rolling it out officially um, later this year, but wanted to give a preview uh, here because I thought this might be interesting for the room. So, with that, uh, happy to take any questions. I have a question for you on stats like XG. There's a lot of debate in the soccer community whether things like XG are, are critical or not. What are your, your uh, thoughts on XG? So on XG specifically, I think it can be really interesting if used correctly. There are basically two use cases for XG that I, th I find interesting. Either if the XG is broadly aligned with the score, it means the team converted on its chances as you would expect, or if XG is completely opposite, which happens a lot, right? where it's totally counter to what the end scoreline is. And that tells you that you know, the team didn't convert on its chances or you know, the other team got lucky and, and caught the team out on a break, for, for example. The trick in XG isn't just putting it on the screen. We're putting it on the screen a lot in the Apple broadcast and you'll see that for, really for the first time we're leading heavily into it. But it's training the, the whole ecosystem on exactly what are those talking points? When do you actually dive in? When do you show it? Otherwise, it's just it's another interesting data point. But what I think it illustrates is, for too long in the soccer world, we really haven't had great data that can be used to tell the, the story of a game. Possession gets shown in every soccer broadcast ever, and it's basically useless. I mean, it, it has no correlation to the end result. Yes, is it a nice story to tell? Is, you know, is this team possessing more than that team? But that's as far or as advanced as almost every soccer broadcast has, has gone. And that is exactly the, the opportunity that we're running at with all these partnerships and Apple. We want to be able to truly use data to help fans understand what's happening on the field of play. And if you talk to our executives, frankly, give the announcers something better to talk about. 
So they're not just filling dead air with stories or you know, mindless banter, but actually giving them interesting tidbits that they can use. Um, and so every week we'll be rolling out more and more data points to help try to uh, identify exactly what works and what doesn't. Some will be great, some will, you know, will bomb, but that's okay. This is part of what we're trying to do in, in testing and learning and, and, and rolling more and more things out. Back there, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for this very interesting talk. I was just wondering in terms of the timeline, do you see all of the great things that you were describing now really pay off by the 2026 World Cup, or do you see the fruits of, those, of that labor um, more being reaped beyond 2026? Well, I hope some of it starts to pay off this year, so I'm not waiting until 2026. I mean, we're, we're investing significantly so that we have access to these data points. On the player development side, right, if a kid's 13 today, by 2026, he's 17, so that, that may not yet fully pay off in terms of first team development and, and contracts. That may take a little bit longer, but broadly in this space, we anticipate much, much faster turnaround than having to wait for, for 26. And I had a question. How much of this data is gonna be publicly and easily available, and what are the, the type of data you might hold back from the public? Um, what I'd say is at the MLS level, a lot of it will be publicly available. We'll, we'll start to expose more and more of it on our website and, and digital channels. Uh, we'll probably be a lot more selective at the youth level, largely because that's a pretty competitive international player market. And I'm not sure we want to expose all the insights you know, for global football clubs to come in and, and cherry pick our best youth kids. Can, can you um, talk about how much of this translates to the women's game and perhaps um, uh, how women's professional soccer fits in the MLS vision? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, we, we love our, our, our partners at the NWSL. They're building something that's tremendously interesting. We'll certainly have lots of conversations with them about, you know, if we build this infrastructure, can they take advantage of it? Um, we share stadiums with them in, in many cities. And so if we already have cameras installed, for example, servers there, it makes a lot of sense to turn it on for their games as well. That'll be evolving conversation. MLS specifically is focused on the men's game. We don't technically have a women's division, but we, we work a lot with them. Hi, uh, how much collaboration will you have with other leagues from other countries? Uh, I'd say we, we, we find it great to, to partner with, with the other leagues. You know, we spend time with the, the team at the Bundesliga. We spend time uh, with the team at the EPL. Um, we have deep, deep partnership with, with Liga Mex. We're launching a competition this summer called Leagues Cup, shutting down our league and their league for, for a month to play a 77-game World Cup-style tournament. So we'll, we'll continue to, to dive in, uh, but those are the three we, we tend to work the, the closest with. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, you mentioned like the three-step process with uh, collection, I think Data Hub was in the middle, and then management as well. Uh, Data Hub being one of the great successes, where do you see you know, one of the biggest problems or gaps being in that three-step process? Um, twofold, one, infrastructure is really challenging, right? Like getting stadiums wired, cameras installed, cameras continually operating and fixed, like that's just always gonna be a challenge. And then second, because of the structure, we're always gonna be dealing with different data suppliers. And so creating consistency in the outputs, IDs help, but in metrics and measurement, that, that'll always be a challenge as we're trying to coordinate on the back end. All right, let's do one more and then, then we'll. Yeah, I was hoping you could clarify whether Data Hub is a custom in-house solution or the open source Data Hub? Uh, it's custom in-house, something that um, we were working with Sport Tech, but it's, it's software that they built for us um, and will then run and operate. But happy to answer more questions. Thank you guys very much for, for coming. <laughs>